Ladies and gentlemen, they say the next big thing is here. The Steve Warnicky Show. Hello, hey yo. Well, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Steve Warnicky Show. That is me. And the only place where you're going to hear this kind of information, this kind of in depth analysis when it comes to police officers, is here. And it's stevewarnicky.com. Podcast articles and more for you, all there. Today, I want to show you yet another example of a media story that has brought us to this point in time where we are here, where there's a major distrust, undeserved distrust, of police officers. It's because police incidents take a lot of explanation. You can't do it in 30 seconds or a minute on a television package. And to be fair, this story in particular came from Fox News, and Fox is typically pretty fair in their police reporting, I think. And you'll notice that there is a balancing of facts, but I think the overall flavor in your mouth that you leave with after watching a story with like this is police brutality, contagious shooting, all of these buzzword bumper sticker slogans that you're hearing. And I want you to see what it takes to understand the complexity of a police incident, the training involved, the laws involved, and just how much information there is with each case. And I want to see if you walk away from this case today saying the cops were wrong. I don't think you will. The first thing I'm going to do is we're going to go through this news story piece by piece. All right, so I'm, let's start with the video, KDVR Fox 31 in Denver's report. New video of an officer-involved shooting we first told you about over the summer. Two Denver police officers shot a, sus- a suspect eight times in his car after he was reportedly seen waving a rifle while driving. Fox 31's Ashley Michaels joining us now. Ashley, some believe the video shows excessive force. Right, Jeremy, that's what the suspect's defense attorney claims. He's arguing they shot too many rounds too quickly. But District Attorney George Brockler already looked into this case and determined the officers were justified justified to use deadly force. And we do want to warn you, some of this video is a little bit graphic. Okay, so first of all, we've heard the words excessive force twice, which is a buzzword. This is not a case of excessive force. So says the District Attorney of Arapahoe County. Ashley Michaels goes on to clarify some are saying it's excessive force. Well, who are the some? Is it protesting groups? Is it thousands? Is it use of force investigation boards? Eh, No, she goes on to say it's the defense attorney of the suspect who's alleging excessive force. Defense attorneys love to take on cases that are high profile because they get their name out there and they get more business and they get labeled an expert when they get put on television to talk about what they believe is excessive force. And I really wish the news media, especially news directors, would stop saying, "Eh, let's put allegations from defense attorneys and call them news and make this sound like society's in an uproar about what's happening here when it's just one defense attorney. All right, so now they're warning you, and I I think they love to do this, but we're warning you this is graphic. It's graphic television. It's graphic. Well, I'm warning you. It's graphic. It's graphic. That keeps people tuned in. Don't you love that? You know what I mean? Like, we're going to show you some video later, but it's just, I want to tell you it's crazy. Nobody's going anywhere. It's like, oh, there's some crazy video coming up. Okay. I mean, right. Okay. It's not that crazy. I don't think, but I'll let you be the judge. Newly obtained body camera video shows the moment two Denver police officers opened fire on a suspect back in June. 31-year-old Keith Roberts, who was in the driver's seat, is accused of waving this rifle, which was found in his car, at officers during a high-speed chase. He had a rifle in his hand, picking a rifle out the window. The chase ended at this apartment complex when DPD rammed the suspect's vehicle. The body camera microphone wasn't on yet, but witnesses described what they heard. I heard them say, put your hands up. With it, I was less than five seconds. Bam, bam, bam. Okay. We've got a lot of things that we need to recap. I hope you heard that there was a high-speed chase 
that was concluded because officers believed the community was in so much danger that they needed to ram the suspect vehicle to stop him, that he was waving a rifle around in the air. Did you hear that, right? Do you see this every day when you're waiting in traffic? Somebody just out the window with a rifle going 80 plus miles an hour on city streets, endangering you, your children, your parents, your cousins, your brothers, your sisters, your neighbors. And then lastly, I hope you heard the eyewitness say, I heard him for less than five seconds giving commands. So there was an attempt to give commands. Also, a very important piece of the puzzle. And I want you to think about the mentality of somebody that has a rifle in the car and is leading police on a high-speed chase and then gets rammed. Is it likely that he's not going to surrender? Is it likely that he's probably not following commands and directions and laws at this point? Of course. We'll continue with the, with the video now. The officers shot at least 27 times. I just heard him shooting. I just let him load him. Now, people hear that too. 27 times. What are you doing? All right. Let me talk about when police use deadly force. Police use deadly force because they perceive a threat of serious bodily injury or death to themselves or another third party in this instance. Your purpose in using deadly force is to stop the threat. When you are both emerging from a high-speed chase, the two officers both, emerging from a high-speed chase and confronting an armed suspect with a rifle, and who's not obeying commands, you don't have the time to coordinate. Bob, you got this one? I'm going to go ahead and shoot. Well, you know what? You have a better advantage. You both, both the officers, and it sounds like within moments of, them, of each other, perceived a threat and both took action. And one of the things you do not do is you do not fire boom, boom, and then like, Let's, did that work? Did that, is he stopped? Is he, no? Okay, here, let, boom, boom. How about now? Is this working? Is it? Uh, I can't see anything. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we're good. You don't do that. You don't do that. Here's what you do. Oh, shit. Boom, 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 boom. Until you see something that lets you know that this threat is no longer a threat to you. Hands up, hands down, body slumped, gun drops, something. Deadly force isn't a scientific method. You've got adrenaline you're running running while shooting is extremely difficult totally if i sat at a gun range right now and stood there i'm pretty good you get me running while i'm shooting really hard you don't go boom boom and then check and see what's happening you shoot until as best you can you can be sure it's safe to stop shooting and with a semi-automatic handgun boom 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 it's easy to fire 10 12 rounds in a few seconds two, three seconds, you could fire 10, 12 rounds easily. So that's not an abnormal amount of fire. All right, let's go back to the video. Eight of those bullets hit Roberts. This is another case of an overreaction and a gross use of excessive force. Okay, there's the defense attorney. Uh, by the way, she said that the eight of the bullets hit the suspect. He did live, by the way, incredibly. So he's hit eight times out of the 27, and now we get to hear from the defense attorney. It's a gross use of excessive force. Why? We did not hear why. We just heard a defense attorney allege gross use of force. Okay, now how much weight so far, right now, when we dissect this news story with police tactics, what police are taught to do, what police are supposed to do, how much weight do you give this right now? Have you heard anything? That's damning, except buzzwords and phrases like excessive force. Excessive force. This is a, another example of gross use of excessive force. What it's a, another perfect example of, Mr. Defense Attorney, is grandstanding. That's what this is a perfect example of. Why? Why is it excessive force? Because you want some money for your client? Because you want to get him off? Wait do you hear about this defendant, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get there, okay? Let's go back to the video. Here's some more riveting revelations on the part of the defense attorney here. 
Both Denver officers have already been cleared of any wrongdoing. The district attorney saying, I find that both officers reasonably believed the officers' lives and the public were in imminent danger. A district attorney from a neighboring jurisdiction, not one that's over these cops typically, investigated this and exonerated the cops of any wrongdoing. In fact, he went so far as to say they were reasonable in their application and use of deadly physical force. So let's go back to the story. Robert's attorney believes that second officer is guilty of something called contagious shooting. Police officers, because they hear or think they hear or perceive another police officer firing their weapon, they join in. All right. So he didn't say that that's what this officer did, by the way. And when I read the letter to the district from the district attorney, you're going to hear that that's not what the police officer said. And the only clip they played in this video was the police officer saying, I heard him firing, and so I unloaded. But we're not sure who the him is. Him could be the suspect. But they don't say that. They say it in the written version of this story. So the officer's body cam footage says, I heard him firing and I unloaded. And this is the assumption here is that they heard the other officer firing. Now we get a new buzzword. We're getting a new one. Contagious fire. I'll read to you what the officer said because they both gave interviews to this district attorney's office. And I'll read to you exactly why they fired and when they stopped and why they stopped. None of what you're hearing in this story. Go back to the video. He says because the officer already had his weapon drawn when he pulled up and fired a dozen rounds within seconds, it wasn't enough time for him to make his own assessment of the situation. All right, now that's just crazy talk right there. You are supposed to have your weapon ready when you get out of the car. You're not going to get out of the car after you've been chasing a guy with a rifle and go, eh, do I think I need my gun on this one? No, a good cop is going to get out of the car with his gun drawn so you don't die. Because you're most likely going to be engaged in an armed confrontation right now. So I would hope that you'd have your gun ready. And it doesn't matter that he fired 12 rounds in a couple seconds. Sometimes that's all it takes. We just heard on my podcast from last week, an officer negotiated with a suicidal party for 11 to 13 minutes. This witness in this incident said they gave commands for five seconds. Yeah, it's a couple seconds. Listen, when a rifle's pointed at your face, you don't need more than a couple seconds to know that you're in danger. It does, time is irrelevant here. It's the actions of the suspect and the threat in which you're facing and, the, and, and how imminent is that threat. That's what's important here. Plus, the first thing we hear him say is this. I can't see. I can't see. All right. That pisses me off more than anything in this video. All right. So she has, Ashley Michaels has selected a clip here to play for you. I can't see. I can't see. What is the conclusion you draw? I'll tell you what it is. It's he couldn't see, so he just fired blindly. If you are watching this video while it's playing, he says, I can't see. I can't see. After he fired. After. The bullet holes are already in the window. And it's perfectly reasonable to me. I'm not this officer. But when I watch that, do you know what I see him saying? There's bullet holes in the window now. I can't see inside there to see what's going on. But she uses it like a smoking gun here. Oh, he couldn't see and he's firing? What the hell? Excessive force. Contagious fire. That's a terrible use of that soundbite. That soundbite right there, I'm convinced, is one of the only reasons we even saw this story on the news. Let's go back to the video. The officers say they did what they had to to save lives, but Robert's attorney says that doesn't justify their actions. Instead of acting responsibly, they are simply reacting based upon what's happening around them, and that's how people die. I'm going to need a trash can to throw up in right now. I seriously, before I address this, I got to clear the bile out of the back of my throat. <sighs> And you notice, you notice, we did not hear from police executives. We did not hear from the district attorney's office personally. We heard from this dummy defense attorney. He said the police were not acting responsibly. Let me, 
me ask you a question. There's a person with a rifle out in the community driving around, waving a rifle out the window. Who exactly is it? Do you want to go confront this person? Do you want to go stop them from doing what they're doing? Do you want a confrontation and hopefully they give up? But if need be, you could end up in a shootout with this person in order to protect the community in which you live, in order while your kids are walking home from school to not be shot by this crazy man yielding a, wielding a rifle outside of his car. Do you want to be the one to go contact him and get in a shootout with him if necessary in order to stop his actions? If the police were so irresponsible. Why do you suppose the district attorney said they were justified? Police, by the very nature of the job, are reactive. That is what puts the cops at a disadvantage. This is such a stupid statement. I've never heard anything dumber in my life. Police are always reacting to what people are doing. That's what they do. If you're at home beating up your spouse, Police, react to what you've done. If you are not pulling over and are leading police on a high-speed chase, they are reacting to what you are doing. This is why the books and laws are balanced in the police's favor, because they're at a disadvantage, because you, the suspect, the criminals, know what they're going to do. They know what they're planning, and the cops don't. So they get the benefit of the doubt because they're out protecting us and our families and the community and not knowing what this other person is going to do. So they were reacting. Yeah, they were. They were reacting to a guy that was wielding a rifle in a community, going on a high-speed chase. They were reacting when he didn't put his hands up or obey commands at the end of a high-speed pursuit after he had to be rammed to stop it. They were reacting to him potentially shooting his rifle inside of the car, which I'll get to in a minute, which you don't hear any of that on this news story. You don't hear any of it. You won't believe what's in this letter in a minute. And then you're going to walk away, and I hope you walk away pissed off that this was the news story you witnessed on the evening news. I hope you're pissed because the heroes of the men and women that are out confronting armed suspects to keep us safe deserve our support. Let's finish the video. Now, the suspect who was shot did survive. He's facing a trial beginning January 22nd for felony charges stemming from that day. The allegations of contagious shooting against the officers is the suspect's defense strategy. Ashley Michaels, Fox 31. Yeah, really amazing video. Ashley, thank you. I think Ashley Michaels does, some, does a good thing there at the end and says this is the defense strategy. But did that resonate with you? Did that stick out like the words contagious fire, excessive force? Did it? You had to really listen for that nugget. And I'm not sure how or why the human psyche doesn't hear those things. Just because we're so used to hearing anti-police propaganda. Because she said, this is what they're using to get off. This is what they're using to try to get off. And she did say the defendant is facing multiple felony charges stemming from his actions that day. So it's going to trial, and the district attorney has found that there's probable cause to believe that this guy is guilty of multiple felonies and that this is his strategy to get out of it. Why are we hearing about this on the news? Is this news, is it some scumbag's allegation of excessive force and contagious fire, a new buzzword? Let's go to this district attorney's letter, shall we? The district attorney's letter is broken down into several parts. The first is an executive summary. Based on the law and the facts of this incident, I conclude Denver police officers were justified in attempting to use deadly physical force to defend themselves, officers, and the public. Okay, that's his finding. Now he's going to tell you about it. Let's talk about the review from the letter. This is a letter dated September 26, 2017 from the office of George Brockler, the district attorney, 18th Judicial District, serving Arapahoe, Douglas, Elbert, and Lincoln counties in Colorado. 
materials reviewed and information considered. He goes on to talk about his material, what he reviewed and what he considered in making this finding. The first paragraph talks about all of the different things he used. It goes on to say that Mr. Brockler was personally present at the scene and viewed prior to any evidence being moved the, the things at the scene. He also attended a, brief, a police briefing in the mobile command post. So he didn't just, from his lofty desk up high atop the government mountain, issue a statement where the police are exonerated. He was there. He saw it. He walked it. He listened to it. He reviewed it. You elected him to do so. He got off his butt and went out there and looked at it. Okay, that counts for something also, I believe. Summary of the facts. Shortly after noon, June 18th, 2017, Denver police got a report from redacted name. They don't put names of witnesses in here. That a black male had menaced him with a handgun near the intersection of Elmendorf Place and North Tulsa Way. Oh, so we have a victim of a felony menacing. So he had had a gun pointed at him by this guy. Hmm. So this guy's out pointing a handgun. So hmm, potentially as a handgun, too. I didn't hear anything about that in the Fox 31 story. Hmm. I wonder if they're going to find a handgun. Spoiler alert. They do. Denver police quickly arrived in the area. They found the suspect vehicle. Hmm, okay. It was being driven by a sole occupant, later identified as Keith Alfonso Roberts. Robert was driving the silver Chevy Impala, the exact one that was described by the witness. They tried to make contact with him, the police do, who was, the police were driving a marked police vehicle, wasn't an undercover car. Roberts menaced Sandoval with a rifle. Officer Sandoval was the first officer to try to contact him so this suspect roberts menaces a citizen with a handgun and now a police officer with a rifle yeah we should just let him go he's not gonna hurt anybody come on fun stuff no it's the obligation of the police to stop him and you should want the police to stop him do you want to be the one to confront him? No. So clearly he didn't just pull over and give up. In fact, he menaced the officer with a rifle, according to the officer's statement. Okay. Sandoval initiated a vehicle pursuit at times reaching speeds exceeding 80 miles an hour. Hope your kids weren't walking home from school right then. Hope your kids weren't driving home. Hope your husband wasn't on his way to the store and gets broadsided by this guy with a rifle going 80 miles an hour in the city. 80 eluding police, pointing his guns, uh, multiple guns at people. Shortly after the Impala began to elude Officer Sandoval, Officers Christopher Baird and Joey Gasca joined the pursuit. Denver police officers were in separate vehicles. All three had emergency lights and sirens activated as they pursued Roberts. So he pretty clear he knew he was being pulled over or trying to be, right? I mean, you could, that's, they always put that in there to alleviate the soft car argument. Well, I don't think it was a real police car. No, fully marked police cars, all three with lights and sirens activated, not ending the pursuit. Okay, this is the kind of guy we're dealing with, Roberts. This is the kind of guy Roberts is. Roberts continued his efforts to elude police officers driving recklessly, feigning an exit off 225 and ultimately fleeing into Aurora. Roberts and pursuing officers exited 225 at Alameda. Roberts drove over the median Alameda. Okay, not desperate at all. Now he's driving over medians in his car. He drove westbound in the eastbound lanes. Hope it's not your grandmother he hits head on and kills while he's doing this. This is what the police are paid to do. Put a stop to this. As a police supervisor that oversaw chases, I'd say, end this chase as soon as you can. Ram him, pit him, stop this chase. He's endangering everybody. We have to contain this. We have to stop him. That's what you want. That's what we are paying. That's what the cops do. During the pursuit by Denver police officers, Roberts displayed, displayed a rifle, a handgun, and a red bandana out the window of the Impala. At times, pointing the handgun at pursuing officers. So now we got a guy willing to point his gun at police officers. And we get the first attempt, the first hint, eh, eh, he might be a gang member. Also, okay, spoiler alert, he is. As the Impala continued eastbound on East Alameda Avenue, the suspect vehicle turned sharply into an apartment complex. That wouldn't endanger anybody. It's just driving into an apartment complex after driving recklessly the wrong way in traffic, menacing everybody with multiple weapons, running from the cops. Not a danger in an apartment complex. Don't worry about that. 
Baird, who was driving a Mark Denver police unit, broadsided the passenger vehicle Impala of Roberts attempting to, while he was attempting to negotiate a turn. The maneuver pinned the Impala next to a pickup truck and was parked at the location, effectively ending the vehicle pursuit. Good job, police. Good job. You stopped the pursuit. Guess what? He's no longer driving 80. Why? Because the cops stopped him. You're welcome. At this point, Gaska stopped quickly near the Baird patrol vehicle. Corporal Gaska believed the suspect had them outgunned. That's right. Let me just interject another moment here. You never want to bring a handgun to a rifle fight. You ever heard that saying? Because a rifle is more powerful and more accurate, and I could hit something with a rifle at 100 yards that I have no prayer of hitting on purpose, like at least reliably with a handgun. And they say if you're going to go to a gunfight and you know you're going to go to a gunfight, don't bring a handgun. So the police are already at a disadvantage facing a rifle with a handgun. Already at a disadvantage. And they're reacting, defense attorney, they're reacting to what the suspect Roberts is going to decide to do. Once all the vehicles came to rest, this is back to the letter, Gaska exited the patrol vehicle with his pistol as quickly as possible. He observed Officer Baird outside of his vehicle, positioned at the rear passenger corner of the Ford Expedition. Jas Gaska joined Baird at this position. However, they took a few steps to the right, and Gaska was to Baird's immediate left. You see how detailed this letter is, right? Okay? You get a really good idea for where everybody is, and that is corroborated by where the, 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 the body cam video showed. Gaska stated that the sun was at high noon, which created a significant glare, especially from the suspect's vehicle windshield, preventing Gaska from clearly seeing Roberts. Okay, well, you know what? It's sunny out and there's a glare on the windshield, so let's go home. Let's go home. Let's come back. Let's come back at sun. Let's come back after the sun is down. Let's come back in an hour or two when the sun's not at high noon, you guys. I mean, we can't possibly end this here because the sun's up. All right. We gotta be here. It's it's too warm too. Can we resume this one on a cooler day? Because it's a little cloudy and I, I don't like the clouds. No, you have no choice but to continue to end this incident, whatever this takes. And you have to deal with every element just as it's presenting itself, period. Both officers yelled commands to the suspect. All right, corroborated by the witness we saw in the Fox 31 story. Nobody just immediately fired. They tried the commands. Got to give them credit for that. Not trigger happy. Tried to end it. Didn't work. All right. Gaska recalled the lower left corner of the Impala's windshield exploding or shattering and thought Rob Roberts was engaging them. During this time, Gaska heard gunfire. Gaska believed that he and both he and Officer Baird were going to be shot. He said at no time did he or Baird have cover. Cover, I talked about this in one of my other podcasts, is something that will stop a bullet. Concealment is like something that you could hide behind but won't stop a bullet. They were not behind anything. They're out in the open because of where this chase ended, and they don't have a brick wall or a car engine or anything to hide behind to confront this guy. They're out in the open. That is significant, that they are exposed completely without any cover. Significant. Gaska then shot at the direction of the driver vehicle. He does not know how many times he shot. That's typical. So we'll move on to the interview of Christopher Baird. Now, I'm not going to read you every paragraph of this. But Christopher Baird's portion of this letter, the recap of the interview, is seven paragraphs long. I'll read you the significant pieces. Baird believed the driver, Roberts, was prepared to shoot at officers. It talks about how Roberts had the rifle out of the car and how Baird had rammed the vehicle. This is at an earlier point in the incident. And then the suspect brought the rifle back inside. So it talks about how he established there was a rifle and how he knew it was in the car. It talks about his driving. Roberts was, quote, all over the road from one lane to the next, creating hazards for other drivers. Roberts' be driving became increasingly erratic and dangerous to other motor motorists. Once the vehicles were stopped, Baird exited his vehicle and proceeded to the rear of the vehicle in an effort to approach the suspect vehicle to confront him. You're welcome for the officers confronting him so that you can be safe. Baird heard three muffled sounds, which he thought were shots from the suspect's AR-15 inside the vehicle. Following the gunshots was a pause. Baird came around from his own car, got clear view of the suspect vehicle. He observed, quote, glass shatters coming from the windshield. He didn't know who was firing, but he started returning fire at that point in time until the suspect stopped. It talks about when he 
stopped firing. After firing shots, Officer Baird saw Robert's hands raised and cover his face. And that was when Officer Baird stopped firing. Appropriate. What I was saying earlier, that's when you stop firing. Then it goes on to interview Gaska, who says similar stuff. That he also saw the, saw the lower left corner of the Impala's windshield exploding or shattering. He thought the suspect was shooting at them. Then we hear from our Officer Sandoval, who gives a statement also to the district attorney's office, and that is recapped. He was not involved in the shooting, so if you want to read it, go to the Arapahoe County website, district attorney's office website, and I'll put a link to this on our website, and you can read it if you want. But for time's sakes, I'll move on. So here's the follow-up. After the shooting, Corporal Gasca approached the Impala, reached through the driver's window, grabbed Robert's hand, put him in a twist law, lock. Roberts jerked, and Gasca yelled for him not to move. Gasca saw the assault rifle right between Robert's legs. He reached in, pulled the rifle out, removed the magazine, ejected the live round from the rifle's chamber so it was loaded. He's then assisted by other police officers from Aurora in the removal of Roberts from the vehicle, who was then handcuffed. And he suffered only minor wounds, miraculously, and was released from the hospital two days later. In addition to the AR-15 rifle that Gasca removed from the Impala, police also found a Glock 9mm pistol with one round in the chamber, loaded, and four rounds in the magazine. In the Impala was also an unloaded Llama 9mm pistol. Three guns! Now, here's a significant piece of information. The individual refused to consent to an interview, so we never heard from Roberts. Hmm. Now, I realize everybody's got the right to the Fifth Amendment to not incriminate themselves. But we didn't hear from Roberts. If this excessive, egregious use of police force was so egregious, why didn't you talk to the district attorneys? I'll tell you why. Because as of the time of this letter, the history of both the pistols in the car is under investigation. Which means they're trying to find out where the hell they came from. They don't even know about these pistols. The history. Were they used in a robbery? We don't know any of that yet. That's still under investigation. And a red bandana also found in the Impala. Hmm, okay. The scene indicates 27, possibly 28 rounds were fired by officers. Evidence indicates Officer Baird fired 16 rounds and Corporal Gasca fired as many as 12. A total of 27 cartridge casings were recovered. It is possible one cartridge case was not found. Neither officer reloaded his weapon. Okay. So usually they count the the bullets. I'm not sure why there was a confusion about 27 or 28, but the district attorney's office was, was honest about it. We don't know. It could have been 27. Could it could have been 28. Really, it doesn't matter, honestly. I mean, 27 or 28. A single witness, redacted name, came forward to advise he believed Roberts had fired at least one round in the direction of officers when the pursuit was in the area of the 4400 block of Peoria Street. So now we have a witness saying, I think he fired at police. Hmm. Okay. Another witness at the scene, redacted name, says she heard police yelling at Roberts to show us your hands prior to police shooting. She could not see what Roberts was doing in the car. She was approximately 75 yards away. Another person, redacted name, who's Keith Roberts' mother, was on scene and commented to police that Roberts was supposed to be on medication but had not taken it for four to five days and been acting strangely. Something to consider. I'm not saying you got to listen to each one of these pieces. Each one of them by themselves is not a smoking gun. When you start to add them all together and go, eh, it's not a smoking gun, but I'll take that into consideration. And you start to pile this up. By the time I get done with this, it's a heaping pile of that stuff, which should tell you, all right, I mean, this is like totally justified here. It's just like one piece after another. I mean, when you have this much piled on top of itself, it's overwhelmingly clear that they were justified in doing what they did. An Aurora police officer also responded to an emergency room at the medical center of Aurora where Roberts was being treated. Overheard Roberts tell someone it was his plan to die by the cop today. This is later on while he was at the medical center. So he admits later on in a spontaneous utterance while police are around him in the hospital that it was his plan to die. Take that into consideration. He didn't do it. He didn't get killed, but it was his plan. Aurora police executed a search warrant on the Impala. Based on the evidence recovered from the Impala, Aurora police believe that at least one round was discharged from the AR-15 rifle by Roberts. That discharged round was recovered from the passenger side front door of the Impala. It is not known when that round was fired. 
Do you know the significance of that? Sure, he could have been driving around a day earlier, two days earlier, a week earlier, <laughs> fired around into his car. Yeah, maybe, right? You hear that and you go, yeah, maybe, yeah, probably not. Or more than likely, he fired that round at some point while he was out menacing people and in this adrenaline dumping plan to die chase from the police. That's most likely, right? Even if we don't know for sure, just add that little tidbit to the rest of these. So he did fire the weapon. We don't know exactly when, but he did fire it. Shows his intent. Shows how dangerous he was. Shows this wasn't all just some crazy misunderstanding. Detective Connor attempted to interview Roberts, who declined to make any statement. Throw that in the pile. Keith Alfonso Roberts is a documented member of the Inglewood family Gangster Bloods, a violent criminal street gang. He had a criminal history as a juvenile and as an adult. His arrests include aggravated robbery with a gun, possession of a weapon by a previous offender, which means he's convicted of a felony and he had a gun, burglary, possession of a controlled substance, possession of a handgun by a juvenile, and protection order, restraining order violations. He goes on in this letter to talk about the laws, the applicable laws, which we already talked about when police are justified in using physical force and his analysis and conclusion, which I read to you the synopsis of that the officers were justified in using. If you want to read the whole thing, visit our website. So now let me just recap this for you. We have a gang member who's a convicted felon who has a long criminal history, both as a juvenile and as an adult, who has three handguns inside of a car, who's menacing citizens, menacing the police, leading the police on an 80-mile-an-hour high-speed pursuit, endangering the community, the public, you and your family, doesn't give up when the car is crashed into, thank you, cops, for ending this pursuit, at least at some point, most likely discharges a firearm at police officers, the police officers confront him to make the community safe again. And why are we talking about them and their quote unquote gross use of excessive force and their unreasonableness? You know what? A lot of these cases are settled. And we're about to give this gang member who did all this by his own choice, might I add, with this long criminal history. Let's give him some tax money. That's what we're going to do. Because a lot of these cases are settled. That's what we should do. Let's pay him. And you know what? Eh, contagious fire. We should let you out of jail again. He should still be in jail. But he's not because of the overcrowding. So the cops are having to deal with them. And now to top the insult to injury off, because instead of having a parade to honor the bravery of these officers, we're questioning them even after the investigation's been done, but instead, we're questioning them and we're probably going to give this gang member criminal money. Perfect. Perfect. I love it. I love the way this works here in this country. That's what we're doing. That is what the narrative on cops is doing. This is the danger. This is what's getting people killed. This guy needs to be locked up for a long time and throw away the key, and we should have a parade or at least a thank you lunch for these guys for risking their lives so that we could all be safe instead of questioning their quote-unquote contagious fire. Because the point at which they did fire seems reasonable to me considering all of the circumstances. So if you're content with raising the eyebrow of suspicion at the police and giving this guy money and letting him off of all of his charges because some defense attorney came up with a catchy two-word phrase called contagious shooting. Let's just do that then. I know everybody's better than that. I know we're going to do more. This is the beginning of a revolution. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you over at stevewarnicky.com. Articles, podcasts, and more. Get a copy of my book, The Void of Blue. We'll see you next time. Have a good one. We didn't stop the fire.